first time attendees here. If so, would you please stand, give us your name, and tell me how you heard about us. I see no. Oh, I see one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Tom Hildner, and I learned about it from you. <laughs> That's a good source. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to make a um, give a little plug to Carl Mink and Milburn Camera for the job that he's doing with the videography. Uh, he's a real professional, and uh, it's a credit. It, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him. So if you folks need any camera supplies, film, whatever, try Milburn camera, either in Livingston or in Milburn, and you'll get good service. Completely unsolicited. <laughs> <laughs> I want to spend a few minutes tonight giving a real plug for the next meeting, which is Tuesday, June 23. We're going to have a historian and teacher named Pat Schuber, who's going to give a lecture on an operation called Operation Anthropoid, which was the code name for the assassination of the hated Richard Heydrich, the head of the security office, RSHA, acting Reich's protector the protector, protectorate of, Bo of Bohemia and Moravia. He was one of the cruelest Nazis, and that took a lot, took a lot to do, uh, that ever uh, stood in German shoe leather. The operation to assassinate him was carried out in Prague on 27 May 1942, after having been prepared by the British Special Operation Executives with the approval of the Czechoslovakian government in exile in Britain. <coughs> Although Heydrich was only wounded in the attack, he died of his injuries on June 4, 1942. And his death led to a wave of merciless reprisals by German SS troops, including the destruction of one small village called Ladis and all of its inhabitants. Latis was a small, was, that's the right word, village in the Czech Republic just north of Prague. On specific orders from Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler, the town was completely razed right to the ground. The only thing left was a few bricks and parts of a few wool. This happened on June 10, 1942, just a short time after the assassination. In all, 173 men, men over age 15 were executed. Another 11 men not in the village were caught, <coughs> arrested, and executed, along with several others already under arrest. 184 women and 88 children were deported to concentration camps, and few of those ever survived. If you go on Google and pull up Ladis, you'll see a plaque. That's all that remains of this town. Uh, and it's a, a testament to how cruel the Nazis could be when they wanted to. All right, tonight's program is a lecture about a little known event in the history of World War II, about the Japanese super submarine L-400 class, and Japan's plan to use these submarines to alter the course of World War II. Now, we all know there were a number of significant secret weapons developed during World War II, such as jet, air, jet aircraft and the ME-262 ME uh, rocket, and missiles like the V-1 and V-2. But one of the most secret and potentially most controversial, terrorizing of them was this submarine about which you're going to hear about tonight. Bruce Tucker, who's going to tell us this story, has taught history in, at Rutgers University School of Continuing Education and was recently awarded the 215 Mar Marlene M. Pomper History Teaching Award. Bruce 
also lectures and presents living history at various libraries, colleges, senior centers, and community centers throughout New Jersey and Pennsylvania and New York City. Brooks is a graduate of the City University of New York and the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken. He last lectured to us back in November of 2013 on Operation Catapult, the destruction of the French Navy during the fall of France in the summer of 1940. And he was warmly received, and for that reason, uh, he asked him to come back tonight and give us the lecture about the Japanese submarine. Bruce, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to stand up here for you know maybe a minute or two, and once the presentation starts, you probably won't see me much until the end. But you will hear my voice, and you will see some very interesting video and some very interesting slides about the story that I'm going to share with you. When I was here back in 2013, and I was talking about the Mirz El Kabir incident, during that presentation, I mentioned something about a submarine during that during that presentation. And it was about a submarine, a French submarine, called the Surcouf. Now, you may not know much about the Surcouf, uh, because it was only a single submarine. It was built before the, the Second World War, and it didn't have a very long life during the war itself. Uh, but one of the things that was significant about this submarine is that it was capable of carrying an airplane and launching that airplane from the deck of the submarine. <laughs> It also was capable of uh, operating almost like a surface ship. It had very large deck guns on it. So one could look at it and wonder, what is it? Is it an aircraft carrier? Is it a cruiser? Or is it a submarine? Now, unfortunately, it was involved in an accident that took place early in the Second World War and never really had an opportunity to show what it was capable of. But the idea of a submarine being able to do all of these other things always sort of intrigued me. And uh, about the same time that I was uh, giving this lecture, a book was published called Operation Storm uh, by John J. Geoghegan. And this, this story is all about not the French submarine that I was talking about, but something very similar. The Japanese had an idea during the Second World War of creating this super submarine that would be able to function like an aircraft carrier, also like a cruiser in some ways, a huge ship, much larger than any other submarine that was in, in existence in the world at that time. And uh, the other thing that intrigued me about the story is why have we never heard much about it? And uh, recently, perhaps about two years ago, but also about the same time that I was giving this lecture on Mirz El Kabir, the wrecks of these submarines were discovered and being explored after all these years sitting on the bottom and no one really knowing very much about it. And that's really part of the story I'm going to share with you tonight. So the first thing I want you to, uh, to take a look at is uh, uh, I, I, when, I, when I do uh, classes in history, I like to mix a lot of different uh, material, video and audio and lecture, because everybody learns things a little bit differently and everybody reacts to things a little differently. <coughs> And I want to try to make this history come alive for you. So I did some research for you. I found an actual piece of footage that was filmed in August of 1945 when one of these submarines was captured by the US Navy. And so what you're going to see here on the screen, as soon as this introductory uh, scene finishes, you see a sailor. He's just about to release an anchor chain. Okay? This has nothing to do with a submarine. But right after this scene, you're going to see this monster, okay, and I have, I have built a model of this submarine. I was that intrigued that I took the time out to actually build a model of it. Um, I've been building ship models and airplane models since I was 10 years old, and so I just think this is another way of enhancing my presentation. So uh, for those of you who saw it when you were coming in, uh, this, this is a model of the, by the way, it's not an L-400, it's an I-400, okay, and uh, it's over 400 feet long, okay. It's the largest submarine ever built up until that time in the world. And it's capable of launching four aircraft off of its deck. And those aircraft are capable of carrying up to an 1,800-pound bomb each. Okay? So that's pretty, pretty significant. You're going to see some film of one of these submarines as it's actually being captured by the US Navy. The film runs perhaps about three minutes or so. It's a silent film. There's no talking on it. 
Uh, but I want you to see it before I go into my presentation on the background of this and uh, what does it mean in terms of today's modern uh, submarine force. Okay, so um, it, uh, I'll, I'll get the light. Can we get the <coughs> back lights? Is there a switch? Yes. Everything goes on there. There you see the silhouette of the I-400, and you can see some of the Japanese crew mm -hmm. on the deck. And you can see that huge five-inch deck gun at the back. That's the largest deck gun on any submarine during the Second World War. But you can tell if you've seen the silhouette of other submarines, such as U-boats or American submarines, that the, the, this, this conning tower is huge compared to the typical conning tower of a World War II submarine. It's because right under that conning tower is a hangar that contains this <coughs> long piece here. It contains four aircraft. You can also see these guns. These are 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. There were four of them on the conning tower. So she's well, well capable of defending herself from aerial attack. Now this is being shot from a ship that's right next to the <coughs> I-400. And you can see both American and Japanese crew members uh, on the conning tower. See both the American flag and the Japanese flag hanging from <coughs> that jack staff. And this is literally within hours of the capture of this submarine. There's the launching ramp that the aircraft would launch from. It's about 85 feet long and it uses compressed air to launch the aircraft into the air. When the submarine was first spotted by one of the American submarines, it was so much larger than their own ship, they actually at first thought they were coming up on a cruiser. Mm. So they got closer when they realized it was not a cruiser, but actually just a huge submarine that, that they did not even know existed up until that point. You can see the stencil number uh, on the extreme left-hand side there, 00I400. There. You see Japanese and American and some more Japanese, American, Japanese, all over the all over the conning tower. Here that's a shot of the crew right there surrendering. How many were on board? It had a crew of about 150. They had pontoons land in the water and then they're picked up by a crane which is retracted onto the deck, brought back onto that launching ramp and then slid back into the hangar. But I'll show you that in the slides that I have. Why did they surrender? The end of the war. Oh, this is at the end this of is, the This is August 45, it's after the oh, Hiroshima and okay. Nagasaki. And they were all told to surrender, although some of them were rather reluctant to do so. In fact, the captain of this particular submarine, just before they surrendered, shot himself. And the executive officer was the one who surrendered the ship to the Americans. And you can see a close-up view of that anti-aircraft gun just forward of the conning tower. How could they exchange shells with a heavy an American ship, because usually the sub's hull was, hull was too thin. They couldn't exchange anything with American subs. No, I meant this ship. How could it take a hit from a, a, a heavy American gun? Well, I think it would be trying to avoid taking a hit from an American Yeah, gun. I would assume. Or just yeah. like the merchant ships, yeah. rather than warships. Oh. Okay. All right. I also have a big still image here of, uh, of the I-400 you can see. This mm -hmm. is. This was a still picture that was taken uh, just after the submarine was uh, captured. How many of these boats were built? Three. 
Three. Three were operational, but the plan was actually to build 50 of them. But we'll get into that. <coughs> all, all three of the, uh, the ones that were built were sunk. In fact, uh, here, uh, I'll show you a slide that shows that. There you go. Mm. Spring of 1946. Just 10 months after the end of the Second World War, a large underwater explosion rocks the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Hawaii. And America has just destroyed one of Japan's most advanced weapon systems. The sinking of an advanced top secret submarine was in fact a preemptive strike at the very beginning of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. It was a brazen decision by the United States to keep the sub out of Soviet hands. Mm -hmm. The plan worked for over 60 years until recently when a team of underwater explorers from the University of Hawaii located the remains of these ships, or one of them anyway. The super submarine would have been able to travel around Cape Horn or the Cape of Good Hope. Truly it was a global weapon system. A system that married the technical advantages of both sea and sky. As America scrambled to build its nuclear bomb and the Nazis experimented with the V-1 and the V-2, the Japanese hoped that their secret weapon would also change the course of the war. And who came up with this idea? Isoroku Yamamoto, Admiral of the Japanese Navy. Six months before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Imperial Navy dominated the Pacific Ocean. The architect of Japan's strategy was Admiral Yamamoto. Yamamoto had his doubts about the success and tried to devise a capability that would accomplish what he considered a quick defeat of the Americans. Pearl Harbor did not achieve the desired result because of the fact that the critical aircraft carriers he wished to destroy at Pearl Harbor were not there. Yamamoto needed something totally unexpected. His solution would be a super weapon that would unite the firepower of an aircraft carrier with the stealth of a submarine. If it could be built, it would rewrite, rewrite the rules of warfare. The concept of putting a plane on a submarine was not a new concept. Most of the submarines of the 1930s were capable of carrying one small aircraft for reconnaissance or targeting. And this was a practice that was already being done with battleships and cruisers using spotter aircraft. <coughs> Yamamoto considered the success of the German U-boats between January of 1942 and March of 1942. To test the capabilities of the Japanese Navy in February 1942, he sent several Japanese submarines to the American West Coast near the beach at Santa Barbara, California to shell a refinery. It did not cause much damage, but it did trigger fears amongst the local population. And this is a form of terrorism. The panicked American reaction convinced Yamamoto that this strategy might work, but he would need some sort of hybrid weapon that would combine the firepower of the aircraft carrier with the stealth of a submarine. There's a, a uh, Santa Barbara News Press article about the submarine shelling the Ellswood oil fields. Now, of course, some, some fancification of uh, a Steven Spielberg movie tried to depict uh, a Japanese submarine lying off the coast of the Santa Monica Pier. I don't know how many of you saw this film, which starred John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and Ned Beatty and uh, a whole bunch of other people there. Uh, this event was parodied in, in 1979 by the film 1941. And in it, there was a mock attack on the Santa Monica Pier, and it showed the panic that would ensue from such an attack. Now, I was talking to you a few minutes ago about the French submarine. It was built in the 1930s, so here's another look at that. This is the Sercouf. The Sercouf was mm -hmm. ordered and built in December 1927. Mm -hmm. It was launched in 1929. It was commissioned in May of 1934. Mm -hmm. The Sercouf was named after the French privateer, Robert Sercouf, and it was the largest submarine ever built, only surpassed by the first of the Japanese I-400 class submarines in 1943. So here you see the huge 8-inch guns. There's two of them. They're mounted in a turret in the front of the conning tower. 
And there's a hangar at the back of the conning tower, which is capable of carrying a single aircraft that could be launched. And you see some of the crew assembled on the deck. Here's a, uh, another depiction of the Sukuf, and you can see the one single aircraft sitting on the deck behind the conning tower. The Sukuf was 361 feet long, 29 and a half feet wide. It was designed to be an underwater cruiser. It was intended to seek and engage in surface combat. For reconnaissance, it carried a Besson MB-411 observation float plane in a hangar built aft in the, behind the conning tower for combat. She was armed with six 50 caliber machine guns, and the submarine had uh, four 400 millimeter or 16 inch torpedo tubes, and twin 8 inch guns in a pressure tight turret forward of the conning tower. The guns were fed from a magazine holding 60 rounds and controlled by a director with a range finder mounted high enough to be able to view five, uh, five to six miles away and able to fire within three minutes of surfacing. Pretty, pretty effective uh, weapon. But unfortunately, only one of them was built. Where was it built? France. I know that, but where? La Havre. La Havre. La Havre. In January 1942, the Free French decided to send the Sukuf to the Pacific Theater of War after she resupplied at Bermuda. Her movement triggered uh, rumors that she was going to liberate Martinique for the Free French from Vichy. The Sukuf may have been sunk on the 18th of February 1942, about 80 miles north of Cristobal, Cologne, while en route to Tahiti via the Panama Canal. The American freighter Thompson Likes, steaming alone from Guantanamo Bay on what was a very dark night, reported hitting and running down a partially submerged object which scraped along her side and keel. Her lookouts hurt people in the water, but the freighter carried on in its course without stopping, as they thought they had struck a German U-boat. The cries for help were heard in English. A signal was sent to Panama describing the incident. The loss of the Sukuf was announced by the Free French headquarters in London on the 18th of April, 1942. There's another depiction of, uh, now, this is, now this is not the Sukuf. This is HMS M2, which was a Royal Navy submarine that was completed in 1919 and converted in 1927 into the world's first submarine aircraft carrier. She was shipwrecked in Lime Bay, Dorset, Britain in January of 1932, and after the loss of the M2, the Royal Navy abandoned submarine-launched aircraft completely. But there you see another variation of the idea. So, uh, Admiral Yamamoto was getting this concept from others. This wasn't something he just dreamt up all by himself. Yamamoto ordered another test mission with a submarine equipped to launch a single aircraft that would drop incendiaries on an Oregon forest. The I-25 was a B-1 Type 1 submarine of the <coughs> Imperial Japanese Navy that served in World War II and took part in the attack on Pearl Harbor and carried out the only aerial bombing of the continental United States during the war. During the so-called lookout air raid and the bombardment of Fort Stevens, both attacks occurring in the state of Oregon. So this is the I-25 and you can see it has a single aircraft being stored in a hangar in front of the uh, conning tower, as I pointed out to you with my laser beam there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right. But this is much more of a conventional submarine, except for the carrying of the aircraft. And this is a painting uh, showing the I-25 uh, with the aircraft launching from its deck. The I-25 was about 2,600 tons, 354 feet long, and it had a range of about 14,000 miles, a maximum speed on the surface of 23 knots, or about 27 miles an hour, and a maximum submerged speed of about 8 knots, or about 9 miles an hour. It carried a two-seater reconnaissance float plane known to the Allies as a Glen. It was disassembled and it was stowed in a hangar in front of the conning tower, as you saw in the previous illustration. The one and only foreign military aircraft to bomb the mainland of the United States was this float plane named the Glenn, launched from the I-25 on September 9, 1942. Mm -hmm. The aim of the mission was to set fire to the forests of southern Oregon, an ambitious aim when all you have are two 
170 kilogram bombs and rain has been falling throughout the night beforehand. The fire failed to catch, but it confirmed that an aircraft could slip past coastal defenses and attack the U.S. mainland, and that's what Yamamoto was really looking for. The panicked American reaction to the Oregon attack confirmed Yamamoto's theory. If he could strike the Americans at home, they might think twice about an all-out war with Japan. To instill such fear would require much more firepower and more than a few submarines equipped with a single aircraft. An aircraft carrier and a fleet of bombers would be ideal, but the United States was now on high alert, and so no carrier would be able to sneak up and attack as had been done at Pearl Harbor. Yamamoto ordered his naval engineers to design a fleet of submarine aircraft carriers capable of being undetected and sailing across the Pacific and attacking West Coast cities, then disappearing without a trace. The Admiral expected that these same subs would be capable of reaching the East Coast of the United States and attack cities like New York and Washington. He hoped to terrorize American cities with attacks like this in the same way that Tokyo was shocked by the Doolittle Raid of April 18, 1942, which had only used 16 aircraft and yet inflicted a terrorizing effect on a complacent and confident military and civilian population. So here you see uh, this, these photos I have up here. This is one of the B-25s <coughs> taking off from the Hornet as part of the Doolittle Raid. This is the map that shows uh, the, the range between uh, uh, Japan, where there, there's the Hornet, and there's the flight to Tokyo, and then the direction that the bombers would be taking before they ran out of fuel. On the right side here is more of the hypothetical idea of using one of these I-400s to attack cities like New York or Washington. And here is a hypothetical drawing of an I-400 sitting off the uh, coast of New York City, launching the first of its four aircraft to bomb the Empire State Building. They were serious about this. This was not a joke. New York City, with its dense population, even if it had been attacked by just tens of aircraft striking important points of communication and iconic targets like the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, port facilities, and major bridges. The Admiral named the submarine the I-400 and declared it to be top secret. And the interesting thing about this is that secret was kept until August 1945. The United States had no knowledge of the existence of these submarines until one of our submarines pulled up alongside and accepted its surrender. By mid-1942, after the defeat at Midway, Yamamoto knew that time was running out as America's industrial might would soon be gathering steam and was insulated by two vast oceans from bomber attacks. America was already working on its own secret weapons, and one of those would change and dominate the rest of the 20th century. <coughs> Codenamed the Manhattan Project and headed by Robert, Robert Oppenheimer, an ambitious attempt to split the atom and create the atomic bomb. The project moved at a furious pace because it was believed at that time that both Germany and Japan were working on a similar weapon. Meanwhile, in Tokyo, engineers were struggling with how to create what Yamamoto had requested. The vessel would have to support the weight of a heavy hangar and three or four aircraft on its deck while still being able to function as a submarine in all other respects. The standard submarine at that time was shaped like a cigar with a cylindrical hull of up to about 300 feet a longer conning tower to contain the hangars, a longer hull to allow for the launching of the aircraft would be necessary for this wor to work. This required a radical reconfiguration of a basic hull structure. <coughs> the configuration was basically ten times longer than its width. Simply adding the hangar on deck with all that additional weight on a standard hull would create a top-heavy and unstable craft. The next approach was to consider scaling up the size of the central cylinder of the sub to lower the center of gravity. 
A large central cylinder would be extremely heavy and require thick walls to withstand the pressure of depths up to 300 feet. The Japanese came up with an innovative alternative, two parallel cylinders bound together in a twin hull design with a heavy conning tower mounted in the middle and centered between the two cylinders. And here you can see the illustration. This was a model that was actually constructed in a test tank <coughs> at a naval research facility. And here you see the diagram of how they took the two parallel cylinders and brought them together, creating a, the wide enough platform to support the weight of the aircraft and the hangars. Here's a close-up of that. This, is the, this would be the hangar area up here. The two parallel cylinders of this design were flatter and more stable and capable of supporting the additional weight of three fully armed attack bombers that would be housed in a deck mounted waterproof hangar. Once the design was finalized and approved by Admiral Yamamoto, construction plans were immediately drawn up. The first I-400 went into production in January of 1943. Admiral Yamamoto needed this weapon completed quickly as the Japanese were beginning to lose ground in the Pacific. <coughs> With his aircraft carrier fleet decimated at Midway in the middle of 1942 and the loss at Guadalcanal in August of 1942, Yamamoto was desperate to have his secret weapons ready to strike at America's coastal cities or perhaps the Panama Canal. With growing shortage of, of steel and manpower, Yamamoto had scaled back his plan from the original 60 submarines to just 18. With work on the first I-400 underway, the Japanese began to work on developing the bomber that would have to fit inside and operate from the I-400 class submarine. And this is a diagram of that aircraft. The bomber would be called the Echi M6A Saran. Saran means missed on a fair day because the plane was designed or intended to appear suddenly out of the mist, carried by a submarine that would surface once it was near the target, moving like a ninja. With a maximum speed of 300 miles an hour and a capability of carrying up to an 1,800 pound bomb load, the Saran would be an intimidating warplane. But the Japanese aircraft designers had some technical problems to work out. Although the I-400 was wider than any other submarine in its day, its aircraft hangar was only 11 feet in diameter. The fuselage would fit, but not the wings and not the tail. To accommodate the limited space, the designers adopted the use of folded wings, much like that of the American Hellcat fighter, which you see in these photographs. Here you see on the top <coughs> the folded wing of the Hellcat, and here you see the wing is now extended. The Saran went even further than the Hellcat. You can see how the wings would fold back, and you see the waiting hangar waiting to uh, contain the aircraft. Mm. And this is a depiction of how the aircraft would look stored inside the hangar. Now there's still one more problem that needs to be solved. Before the aircraft could be launched, the engines would have to be warmed up. And this would be a process that would take up to 20 minutes. That's a long time to sit on the surface and wait for your enemy to spot you with radar. Starting the engines in the hangar, as you see in this illustration, <coughs> while submerged, would expose the crew to deadly carbon monoxide poisoning. Warming up the engines while on the surface would expose the submarine to enemy radar detection and attack. <coughs> Once again, the engineers needed an innovative solution. Starting a World War II engine aircraft engine, cold is a haphazard and messy affair. The problem is, as, it sh as you see in this photograph, the viscosity or the thickness of the cold engine oil, which is very thick and difficult for it to travel through the engine and provide the proper lubrication, hence the engine would overheat or stall. 
Warming the oil makes a notable difference. And so, by preheating the oil, it would improve its viscosity and allow the engine to warm up faster. Borrowing from a German design, the Japanese came up with a process whereby the aircraft oil is preheated inside the submarine and pumped into the aircraft's engines just prior to surfacing the submarines. Once they come up on the surface, they're basically ready to go. With the aircraft engine oil pre-warmed, the aircraft could be rolled out of the hangar just after surfacing, the engine started, and the aircraft launched immediately. The Japanese crews would train very hard and practice launches in as short a space of time as possible. The Sarans were launched from an 85-foot long compressed air catapult on the forward deck of the submarine. Underneath the catapult track were four high-pressure air flasks connected to a, in parallel to a piston. The aircraft mounted on top of collapsible carriages via the catapult attachment points along the fuselage would be slung in 70 to 75 feet along the track, although the piston itself would only be moving between 8 and 10 feet during the operation. To get the aircraft back onto the I-400s, Japanese engineers designed a huge foldable hydraulic crane that would, host the, that would hoist the Saran back onto the deck where it could be stowed back in its hangar before the submarine submerged. With all their design problems now solved, it looked as if the Japanese would be the first to get their super weapon to war. <coughs> but then tragedy struck. It was not meant to be. Fate takes a hand and the Japanese Navy suffers a devastating loss in April 1943. American codebreakers at Pearl Harbor, who had broken the Japanese naval code, discovered that Admiral Yamamoto was going to make an inspection tour of the Solomon Islands. American P-38 fighters were dispatched to intercept and shoot down the Admiral's plane. And it was almost a month before the Japanese announced Yamamoto's death in May of 1943. And that's a depiction of one of those P-38s. Mm -hmm. And you can see the Japanese Betty containing the Admiral heading down to the jungle surface. <clears throat> this was the route that uh, the Admiral's uh, plane took and the P-38s that intercepted him there. And this is a photograph of Yamamoto's funeral in Tokyo. Without the backing of the powerful Admiral, the I-400 program quickly slipped down the Japanese priority list. Before any subs were completed, the original order of 18 was slashed to just nine. Eventually, this was further reduced to just five. It would take another 18 months before the first of the planned five of, ja of Yamamoto's super submarines would make it to sea. In December 1944, the first I-400 was commissioned. <coughs> a few months later, the I-401 followed her sister. The I-400 was the most lethal submarine in existence at that time. Armed with three heavily armed bombers that could be launched within minutes in a rolling sea from a 65 foot long hangar and catapulted from an 85 foot long ramp. At 400 feet long, it was not just the longest submarine in the world, but it had an operational range of 37,000 miles. Mm -hmm. In addition to her three aircraft, she also mounted on her deck a 5.5-inch gun, the largest ever mounted on the deck of a submarine. And in comparison, the American Gato-class submarine was 311 feet long and had a range of 11,000 miles. The German U-boats at 251 feet had a range of 10,000 miles, and, and the submarines mounted either a 76 millimeter or 3 inch, or a 105 millimeter 4 inch. <coughs> Four waterproof anti-aircraft guns defended the submarine from air attack. The submarine also had eight torpedo tubes in the bow and none at the stern. <coughs> a crew of 144, a test depth of 330 feet, a maximum surface speed of 18 knots and a submerged speed of 7 knots. The I-400 crews were the pick of the Japanese Navy, highly trained, fiercely loyal, and very well treated. 
In the three years since the I-400 had been planned, the state of play in the war had changed dramatically, and now America dominated the Pacific and was closing in on the Japanese home islands. And this just gives you a sense of uh, the movement of the American fleet uh, in 1944 into 1945. The original mission of the subs was to bomb American cities and to terrorize the American public. And this was now completely outdated. They no longer had the firepower to pull off a significant enough raid. With each sub carrying three planes and each plane only carrying one bomb, they could do very little damage. By comparison, Nazi bombers dropped an average of 330 bombs per night for 57 nights during the London Blitz, and still the British did not surrender. With a conventional bombing raid out of the question, the I-400 needed another mission, anything that would slow the advance of the Americans or get the Americans to negotiate a peace. They began to consider the use of germ warfare against the American cities. The obvious means of delivery for this germ warfare was considered to be by way of aircraft launched from the I-400 class submarines. In the spring of 1945, Vice Admiral Ozawa, that's his picture, proposed a top secret controversial plan. He suggested using the Saran bombers launched from the I-400 submarines to attack west coast American cities. Such an attack would kill thousands of civilians <laughs> and create panic across the United States. Japan's biological weapons program was not new. It was known as Unit 731, based in the Pingfang district of Harbin, the largest city in the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo, northwest China. Between 3,000 and 12,000 men, women, and children, from which around 600 every, every year were provided by the Kempentai, died during the human experimentations conducted by Unit 731 at the camp based in Pinfang alone, which does not include victims from other medical experimentation sites. Almost 70% of the victims who died in the Pinfang camp were Chinese, including both civilian and military. Close to 30% of the victims were Russian. Some others were Southeast Asians and Pacific Islanders at the time of the colonies of the Empire of Japan, and a small number of allied prisoners of war. The unit received generous support from the Japanese government up to the end of the war. This is a photograph, an aerial photograph of Unit 731. Fortunately, and I, I emphasize fortunately, a month later, cooler heads on the Japanese imperial staff prevailed. General Yoshiro Umezi, who later signed the Japanese surrender on the USS Missouri, decided that germ warfare against the United States would escalate the war against all humanity. And the plan was scrapped. Now that's, uh, that's the general bowing down there, signing the documents, and that's, that's his photograph. No. The biological attack off the table, the Japanese Imperial staff decided on another mission for the I-400, submarines of which now only four had been completed at this point. The Panama Canal. The canal was crucial for the transfer of war materials <coughs> and supplies and troops from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It would force the Allies to use the much longer route around Cape Horn. <coughs> Japanese military planners and intelligence experts worked on this plan. <laughs> Four submarines carrying 12 aircraft across the Pacific until they came to a launch point off the coast of Ecuador. They would launch the aircraft which would fly across Colombia and circle back around to attack the, from the Caribbean side of the locks. The mission was extremely hazardous. First they would have to navigate through waters swimming with American ships. By the summer of 1945 the Pacific Ocean was an American lake. But the I-400s did have one technical advantage that they had bought, borrowed from their <coughs> German allies, a technology that could help them elude enemy sonar. A special coating was made from a mixture of gum, asbestos, and adhesive, and applied to the hulls from the waterline to the, to the keel. 
This coding was apparently based on German research through completely <coughs> different, although completely different in composition from the German coatings. This was intended to absorb or diffuse enemy sonar pulses and dampen reverberations from the boat's internal machinery, theoretically making detection while submerged much more difficult. The coatings did work remarkably well, and the details of this are still classified. And I might point out that modern American, British, and Soviet submarines all use that coating today to mask their <coughs> positions against sonar. So the Japanese were way ahead of their time with this. Following an inspection in Rabaul in August of 1943, Captain Yamamoto and Commander Fujimori conceived of the idea of using the secret submarine attack to destroy the locks of the Panama Canal in an attempt to cut American supply lines to the Pacific Ocean and hamper the transfer of U.S. ships. Intelligence gathering on the proposed target began later that year. The Japanese were well aware that American fortifications existed on both sides of the canal. On the Atlantic, a large coastal artillery battery called Fort Sherman, which had guns with a range of 17 miles, prevented enemy ships from getting near enough to shell the locks. In the months following the attack on Pearl Harbor, air and sea patrols had been strengthened around both entrances, and barrage balloons and anti-submarine nets were erected. In August 1942, the 88th Coastal anti-aircraft artillery was added to defend against aerial attack. So they were, they were preparing for this kind of attack. Oddly enough, Hollywood actually conceived of the idea before the Japanese Imperial staff did, with a screenplay by Robert Garson and Richard McCauley, and in, in a film that was released in September 1942, directed by John Huston, starring Humphrey Bogart and Mary Astor, about a Japanese plot to attack the locks of the Panama Canal. But this was not a Hollywood stunt or screenplay. This was the real deal. As the war continued and Japan's fortunes declined, security around the canal grew increasingly lax. In January 1944, Commander Fujimori personally interviewed an American POW who had done guard duty at the, at the locks. He told Fujimori that the defensive air patrols had virtually ceased since it was considered increasingly unlikely that the Axis powers would ever attack the locks. This further convinced Fujimori of the plan's feasibility. A Japanese engineer who had worked on the canal during its construction handed over hundreds of documents of the Naval General to the Naval General Staff, including blueprints of the canal structures, the construction methods of the canal, a team of three shipping engineers studied the documents and concluded that the locks at Miraflores on the Pacific side were the most vulnerable to aerial bombing, but the Gaten locks on the Atlantic side offered a chance of causing greater damage since it would be harder to halt any outflow of water. They estimated the canal would be unusable for at least six months following a successful attack on the locks. To increase the size of the airborne attack force, Commander Fujimori requested that two additional fleet submarines that were still under construction at the Kobe docks, I-13 and I-14, be modified to house two Sarans each, bringing the total number of planes available to ten. It was originally planned that two of the Sarans would carry torpedoes and the other eight would carry 1,800-pound bombs. They were to make a combined torpedo and glide bombing attack against the Gaten locks, and eventually, though, torpedo bombing was dispensed with because only one Saran pilot had mastered the technique. That's another view of the, uh, that's a model of the Saran. You can see the 1,800-pound bomb under the fuselage and above the uh, pontoons. The Panama Canal strike called for four aircraft carrying submarines, the I-400, the I-401, the I-13 and the I-14 to sail eastward across the Pacific to the Gulf of Panama, a journey expected to take approximately two months. At a point 100 nautical miles off the coast of Ecuador, the submarines would launch their Saran aircraft at about 3 o'clock in the morning on a moonlit night. The Sarans, without floats, would fly at an altitude of 13,000 feet across the northern coast of Colombia in the vicinity of Colón. Now on the Caribbean side of the isthmus, 
they would turn westward on a heading of 270 degrees, <coughs> then angle southwest and make their final approach to the canal locks at dawn. After completing their bombing runs, the Sarans were to return to a designated rendezvous point, ditch their aircraft alongside the waiting submarines where air crews would be picked up. In April 1945, Captain Arizumi, the man appointed to carry out the attack, decided that the Saran pilots would make kamikaze ramming attacks against the gates rather than conventional bombing runs, a tactic becoming increasingly common as the war went badly for the Japanese. The Saran squadron leader had already suggested as much of this to Azimori later that month, though for a time he would, it was kept secret from the other pilots. At the end of May, however, one pilot observe, uh, happened to observe a Saran having its bomb release mechanism being removed and replaced with a fixed mount. Realizing the implications of this change, he angrily confronted the executive officer of the squadron, who explained that the decision to withhold this intention from other men was made to avoid the mental pressures on the air crews. By June 5th of 1945, four aircraft carrying submarines had arrived at the Nano, at Nano Wan, where a full-scale wooden model of the Gaten locks had been built and placed on a raft and towed into the bay. The following night, the formal training commenced with the Saran flight crews practicing rapid assembly, catapult launch, and recovery of aircraft. There was also a rudimentary formation flying routine, and from the 15th of June, the Saran pilots made practice daylight bombing runs against the wooden gate mock-up. By the 20th of June, all training ended and the operation was set to proceed. The decision was made to, raid, to make the raid a suicide mission. The I-400 crews prepared for the mission, but fate once again took a hand. Time was running out for Japan and the United States was already planning what Japanese cities to hit with the atomic bomb. When the war arrived on Japanese soil on the island of Okinawa, Vice Admiral Ozawa realized that a raid on Panama would be pointless at this point, and he canceled the mission entirely. The majority of American forces were already in the Pacific, so it made no sense to do that. Fifteen American aircraft carriers had assembled at the Ulithi Atoll and prepared to make a series of raids against the Japanese home islands. The Japanese mission changed to an attack on this base. The second phase of the Ulithi attack was codenamed Arashi, or Storm. The I-400 and the I-401 were to rendezvous at a predetermined point on the night of the 14th or 15th of August, and on the 17th of August, 1945, they would launch their six Sarans before daybreak on a kamikaze mission <coughs> against the American carriers. <coughs> The Sarans, each with an 1,800-pound bomb bolted to its fuselage, would fly less than 160 feet above the water to avoid radar detection and the American fighters that were expected to be patrolling at 13,000 feet above the carriers. Just before departing the naval station, the Sarans were completely overpainted in silver with American stars and bar insignia covering their red uh, Hinamaris, a direct violation of the rules of war. Mm -hmm. This was an attempt to further confuse recognition if the aircraft were prematurely spotted, but it was not well received by the pilots. Some felt it was both unnecessary and a personal insult to fly under American markings as well as dishonorable to the Imperial Navy. Following the attack on Ulithi, the I-400 and the I-401 were then to sail for Hong Kong. There they would take on six more Sarans and sail for Singapore, where fuel oil was more readily available. Then they would join up with the I-13 and the I-14 to stage further attacks with a combined force of 10 Saran aircraft. On August, 5th, August 6th, 1945, the, the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and two days later on Nagasaki. Japan surrendered before the Ulithi attack was launched and on August 22, 1945, the crews of all submarines were ordered to destroy all their weapons. The torpedoes were to be fired without arming, aircraft to be launched without unfolding wings and stabilizers. On August 28, 1945, US destroyer, two U.S. destroyers discovered the I-400, 
The captain surrendered peacefully. The next day, the submarine USS Segundo spotted a second I-400, the I-401. Aboard the I-401 was the fleet commander, Arizumi, who did not know the word surrender. It was a touch-and-go situation, and when asked to surrender, Commander Arizumi refused. Several tense hours passed with the Segundo's deck gun trained on the much larger I-401. The Segundo asked if the I-401 <coughs> would send an officer over. The I-401 replied, you send someone to us. Negotiations for surrender began. At first, the Japanese officers said, quote, if you force us to surrender, we will commit suicide. The Segundo said, no harakiri. Tokyo ordered the I-401 to surrender. Eventually, the Japanese commander agreed to surrender and raised the black flag of surrender on his ship. <coughs> Shortly afterwards, Commander Azurumi shot himself and died. The American crew seized the I-401 and quickly realized it was not unlike any submarine they had ever seen before. The Japanese crew remained on board, but with six Americans in command. The Americans cha chained the hatches open to prevent the Japanese from diving the submarine. Mm -hmm. The next step was reaching <coughs> Tokyo and bringing the submarines home for further study. In November 1945, two of the I-400s <coughs> departed for Pearl Harbor and arrived just after New Year's Day 1946. The third I-400 was built and completed in June of 1945, but was converted to a tanker. It was captured and decommissioned on the 15th of November 1945, and it was sunk as a target off the Goto Islands in the East China Sea on the 1st of April 1946. Navy engineers immediately poured over the subs in the dry dock at Pearl Harbor. They inspected and recorded every detail of the super submarine's design. By the spring of 1946, in a post-war reality that had, be, that had set in, the Soviet Union now demanded access under the terms of the treaty that ended the war. And so that kind of brings us back to our original slide, doesn't it? Concerned that the Soviets would demand to inspect the super submarines, the U.S. Navy made a hasty decision. Instead of handing over the new technology to a potential future enemy, the Navy sank the submarines off the coast of Oahu and claimed to have no information whatsoever on its location. Both subs were sunk off the coast of Hawaii and their positions were designated top secret. On the 31st of May, 1946, the I-400 is sunk and two days later, the I-401 suffers the same fate. That's an underwater photograph taken of the wreck of the I-401. <coughs> Ultimately, the I-400s arrived too late in the war to really make a difference. But while its timing was flawed, its, its technology was way ahead of its time. The wreckage of the I-401 was discovered by the Pisces Deep Sea Submarines of the Hawaiian Undersea Research Laboratory in March of 2005 at a depth of 3,000 feet. It was reported that the I-400 was found later by the same team off the southwest coast of the Hawaiian Islands of, o of Oahu in August of 2013 at a depth of 2,300 feet. The Achi M6A Siren was a submarine launched attack float plane designed by the Imperial Japanese Navy. Its intention was to operate from the I-400 class submarine whose original mission was to conduct aerial attacks against the United States. A single M6A1 has been preserved and resides at the Udvar Hazy Center of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. It is located in Washington, D.C. in a suburb of Chantilly, Virginia near Dulles International Airport. The Saran was surrendered to an American occupation contingent by Lieutenant Kazuo Atsuka at the Imperial Japanese Navy who ferried it from Fukuyama to Yokosuka. The U.S. Navy donated it to the Smithsonian in November of 1962. Restoration on the Saran began in June of 1989 and was completed in February of 2001. 
So there you can see the various states of restoration. That's how it was mm -hmm. sitting when it, when it was uh, ob obtained in 1962. And here is how it looks today um, at the Smithsonian facility. Sitting next to, I don't know how well you can see it, that's the Enola Gay oh. sitting next to it. Mm -hmm. Kind of an interesting historical bookend, I would say. Mm -hmm. The innovative design became a model for future Cold <laughs> War submarines. In the, in the late 1950s, a new type of submarine would be carrying something called a Regulus missile, and it began patrolling the seas. So here you see a pretty much conventional Gato-class submarine, and it's got a rather unusual hangar just behind the conning tower, and you can see the Regulus missile that has been pulled out of the hangar and is now in launch position. Well, of course, the Japanese had no missiles, so substitute the Saran aircraft for the guided missile, and you can see the connection between the two. Mm. <coughs> it bore a striking resemblance to the Japanese super sub, except, of course, it was a guided missile rather than a bomber. This is a Regulus being launched from the deck of that submarine, and here you can see the Regulus in flight. It's basically an early cruise missile. Today we see this uh, conventional stealth weapon has evolved into a primary stealth nuclear weapon system in the world's 21st century navies. This is a, a later variation of submarine. This is also non-nuclear. This was a, a conventional submarine from the 1950s. And you can see the, the hangar and you can see the Regulus missile that is about to be launched off the deck of the submarine. This uh, is the uh, USS Growler on the bottom here. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to visit the Intrepid Air Space Museum in New York City, but right across the pier from the Intrepid sits the USS Growler. So you can see the evolution of the I-400 sitting right across uh, from the Intrepid. Okay, because that hangar has now been moved from just behind the conning tower to <laughs> up at the front of the submarine. And it contains two <coughs> of these missiles not just one. So they can be pulled out and they can be launched and then the hangar closed back up and the submarine of course dives. Right. Now this is a forerunner of this. Okay. This is the Polaris of the early 1960s. Now the, the, it's no longer necessary to keep the missiles in a hangar on the deck because now these are nuclear submarines, they are true submersibles, they spend much more of their time underwater than on the surface, and the missiles are now an internal part of the hull design of the submarine. And down here on the bottom, you have the latest variation of the Polaris, the Ohio class. So on top there is the USS Abraham Lincoln, which was a Polaris missile submarine of, from 1960 to 1985. And on the bottom, you have the USS Ohio, mm -hmm. which has been in operation since 1981, and it's still <coughs> currently in the fleet. There are 18 of these in the U.S. fleet today. How long are they? 500, and glad you asked that question, 560 feet long, okay? Uh, and they have an, their range, unlike the I-400, which was 37,000 miles, the range of the Ohio class is unlimited, except, of course, for food. They run out of food before they run out of fuel. How much does a vessel like that cost? Oh, we're talking in the hundreds of billions of dollars. <laughs> yeah. And you pay for it. Yes. Each of these Ohio class submarines carries 24 Trident ballistic sub missiles. So those are, those are the missiles. You can see one of them has been pulled out of the silo so that you can see it. So the, the submarine carries 24 of those missiles, and each one of those missiles carries eight nuclear warheads, and each warhead is a 100 kiloton warhead, all right? And the range of these missiles is 4,500 miles. And that is the end of my slides. So now I will take questions. Yeah, great. How am I doing on time? Good? Uh, it's good. Okay. Now I'll hear this. Okay, good. Yes. 
a uh, terrific one. Uh, how did the Japanese manage to keep this quiet when they had already broken the Japanese naval codes and they must have been communicating back and forth? Did they try to avoid using any of their codes and use uh, paper messages? And the second question, wasn't the idea of firing the missile out of the uh, bottom of the, uh, inside the submarine, wasn't that a German miss, uh, idea during World War II? Because they attempted to equip some U-boats come into uh, Long Island and bombard New York City and they were sunk off Long Island Sound. Well, I'll, I'll answer them in, in the order that you asked. Uh, the first, in the first, the first question that you asked, as far as the secrecy of the of the I four hundred, the um, the fact that we had broken the Japanese naval code uh, would have been very useful to us as far as the knowledge of the existence of the I four hundred. Had the Japanese included any information about them in their communications, and apparently. Uh, they may or may not have been aware or concerned about the fact that the codes might have been broken, but they put nothing in any of their message traffic that indicated the existence of those submarines. Now, you could also say that because they came so late, there, there might have been traffic about them had they started to construct them earlier on the time frame that Admiral Yamamoto had originally planned, which was in 1942 rather than 1943. Since they didn't really get started until 43, and because of his assassination, we don't really see any completions of any of them until late 44. By the time there might be any reference to them, uh, there's only three. Of, there's only two of them operating, and one of them has already been converted to a tanker. So that might explain the reason why there was no message traffic in them. It wasn't a significant enough uh, a point to mention it in it. But you know, it's still rather chilling to think about the fact that these things existed for so long, either in the construction phase or the design phase or the completion phase, and yet we had no knowledge of their existence until we literally were staring at them eyeball to eyeball. Um, the second question about uh, the German the German design for internalizing the launching of a missile. I know they did some experimenting with that, but I don't think they got as far along as the Japanese did. Of course, the Japanese weren't thinking about using missiles at any point with this. It was always based on the idea of using aircraft. Had they been able to collaborate perhaps a little more on the technology with the Germans, they might have figured out some way to launch a V-1 or a V-2. Uh, from the I-400, but that it's unfortunately never fact, happened. There was actually three or four German subs that came up Long Island Island and they were going to fire V-2s at New York City. Mm -hmm. So, and they, they were sunk, they were detected due to the ultra secret in Blenchley Park. So they, the so they picked sunk. up the message traffic about it and then. they did sink them. Yeah. Did yeah. They yeah. Them? Yes, they did. In, in yes. terms of the payload that it could deliver, was it cost effective to build such a complicated vessel? I mean, it was a fortune to make it. Sure. And, and, and if the it, it could deliver one airplane, it will maybe four later on. Well, I, I don't think, again, you know, it's sort of like you think about the strategy of uh, the Doolittle raid, you know. That was, was, that was they, You have an aircraft carrier with, with, you know, 16 or 18 B-25 bombers. That was probably not very cost effective either in terms of the damage that was done by those bombers, but the psychological value of that attack was really <coughs> what, the, the, what, what the President and, and what the Navy uh, was looking for. And uh, I think the Japanese, is from, from Yamamoto's perspective, uh, he, was really, he was really hoping to shake up the American public to the point where they would shake up their elected officials and say, hey, you know, we, you, know you want to fight your war out there in the Pacific, that's one thing. But when, when things start happening here at home, it's time to start talking. You know? And that's what he was hoping for. Because um, amongst most of his contemporaries, he understood probably better than most of his fellow admirals uh, and, and the Japanese staff that uh, time was running out for them. And if they didn't get the United States to come to the bargaining table pretty soon, there wouldn't be any, there would be no possibility of doing that. And it would end up being a war of attrition that the, the Japanese could never win. So, yeah. How long could the big stuff stay under? Um, you know, I, I didn't get any, any data on what the time is that they would be able to stay, but it was a conventional, uh, as far as propulsion was concerned, as far as batteries was concerned, um, they're, using, they're using diesel fuel and they're using batteries and they're charging batteries when they're on the surface and so forth, all of that. So I would have to assume that 
you know, you might, you might give them an additional factor based on the size of the submarine, the number of batteries that they could carry, that instead of the typical 24 to, to maybe 36 hours at the most, that any of these diesel electric submarines would be able to stay below the surface. You might be able to extend that out perhaps to 48, maybe 72 hours, and that's about it because uh, uh, they, they didn't really have any more sophisticated uh, technology as far as staying underwater and operating on batteries any longer than anybody else did. The Germans were actually making more headway uh, with the idea of staying under longer using, experimenting with different kinds of propulsion systems like hydrogen peroxide, uh, which would generate oxygen, you know, while they were underwater as part of their power plant. Uh, but that was also too little, too late in the war. So for the I-400s, probably not very different. Yep. Did American naval engineers get much opportunity to go through this stuff and study it? Oh yeah, yeah. They, 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 yep. They, they looked it over from one end to the one end to the other, and uh, based on what they saw, that's really the reason why you saw some of those ideas <coughs> popping up in the 1950s in the design of the American submarines. They were no longer, you know, as 10 years had gone by, the idea of, of using uh, an airplane to launch from the deck of a submarine was just no longer, it didn't make any sense if you could have a missile that you could direct and guide to do that, you, first of all, you didn't have to have somebody on it, you know, you didn't have anybody having to go downtown, so to speak, you know. Uh, so that, that really took over. The idea of being able to launch it from, from that surface and, and to be able to have multiple weapons, that would take some time because it required the amount of space that they would need to be able to launch the weapon and still be able to submerge as soon as they launched it, all of that had to be worked out, and so that, that took time. So you start out with the ability to launch one, then you go to the ability to launch two, and once you get past that, now you, you see the, the, the logical extension. It goes from two to uh, eight to 16 to 24. You know, and basically the whole length of the submarine is now becoming a missile launching platform. Mm -hmm. Even surface ships today, you know, when you look at the modern destroyers and the modern cruisers, they've got batteries that can, can fire basically uh, anywhere from 36 to 48 missiles. I mean, that's their main weapon system. They got a small deck gun, you know, and they've got some cannons to, to protect the surface ship. But basically, you've got 48 tubes out of which you can launch anything from a ship to ship missile to an ICBM. Each one of those ships has that capability. So that's even surpassed what a, what a submarine can do as far as launching weapons is concerned. But the submarine still has the stealth because the surface ship is still on the surface and even though it's harder to see because of the stealth technology that's been developed, there's nothing like being able to submerge the boat and not see anything. Yeah. I can understand on a, a hiding a factory or camouflage, but this is a 400 foot ship. Did it have, reconnaissance never showed anything being built? Nope. Never picked, they, never, they never picked anything up. So maybe they had it in a covered, uh, covered shop uh, that uh, the cameras didn't pick it up, or they didn't have any any uh, intelligence or spies that picked up the information, but they never had any information on it whatsoever. It's incredible that they missed it. No. Wasn't Yamamoto really opposed to the war mm -hmm. against the United States? Mm -hmm. It was the Imperial Army yep. that really pushed for it, because he had studied at Harvard. Yes, yeah. Yeah. in the 1920s. He, yeah. was, uh, he was a naval attache, and he studied yeah. at Harvard. He played cards with a lot of the, uh, the lieutenants mm -hmm. and captains who were going to become admirals and face him on the other side. And he was well known to be a person who was a risk taker and a gambler. And so that plays into, you know, when Nimitz and Halsey are playing chess with Yamamoto on the other side, they're using some of that, that knowing how he thinks. And of course, Yamamoto also understood how they thought. So there's a lot of give and take there, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's a matter of the roll of the <coughs> dice. You're at the wrong place at the wrong time. You don't get the reports in time. And so that's what turns battles, not just, you know, uh, knowing how somebody thinks. But yeah, he, he, he was, like I said before, he, he was well aware of Japan's limitations. He was well aware of, of the United States' capability, having been here and seen the industrial power that the United States had compared to what the Japanese had in the 1920s. He was also a young uh, naval officer uh, during the Russo-Japanese War, and he understood the strategy even then was the Japanese cannot sustain a long war. They don't have enough material to do it. So it had to always be a quick 
shot, and then let's talk. See, and they got it in the Russo-Japanese War. They did rather well, but in the war with the United States, they didn't because he didn't deliver the quote-unquote knockout blow that he really wanted. I know from the perspective of of the United States at that time, it certainly from the general public felt like a knockout blow because it's the Pacific Fleet and the Pacific Fleet's been decimated and all these battleships have been either terribly damaged or destroyed and thousands of casualties. But from a strategic point of view, it wasn't as bad as, as a lot of people thought it was. And Yamamoto understood that. He understood that he had unfinished business, that he had to finish or lose the war. Whether he was going to live long enough to see the end of it was not something he was going to know. But he knew that if there was any chance for Japan to win or come out any better than it started, it would have to be after a knockout blow and a negotiated peace. Once Midway was lost, um, he lost that. He lost that initiative, and now it was basically just trying to grasp for straws. Any possible advantage that he could get, if he could scare the United States into thinking that the Japanese had some kind of a terror weapon up their sleeve, and that's not all that different than what we were trying to do with the Japanese with the Doolittle Raid. You know, they gave them the the intelligence story was that we had a secret island somewhere and that the planes had taken off from Shangri-La, you know. But it was in fact the Hornet, you know. And our, our, uh, our, our, our ability to do that was stretched to the limits. But they didn't know that. All they knew was the Americans had struck them at home, and that shook them up. So he said, well, if it works on us, it certainly could work on them, if we could pull it off. But they couldn't do it with aircraft carriers, because he lost all those carriers at Midway. You know, and America was beginning to build up and beginning to look more carefully at what was getting close to it. So he needed something to be stealthy. He needed something that would come in uh, and be undetected and then surface and then have a devastating attack of 10 or 12 bombers. I mean, you can just imagine if he was able to pull that scenario off of getting, imagine if he was able to build 25 or 30 of those submarines if you had 20 of them sitting off the coast of uh, Long Island, and they each launched three aircraft, then you've got a wave of planes coming over Manhattan, mm -hmm. densely populated Manhattan, blowing up all the bridges of East East River, blowing up the Statue of Liberty, blowing up the Chrysler Building and the Empire State Building, and then flying back, getting picked up, and taking off before the US Navy's destroyers even know what's going on. And if that happened in, in the middle or towards the end of 1942, the United States Navy was woefully unprepared for that at that point. Right. A year later was a different story, but within the first six months of Pearl Harbor, that would have been a yeah. devastating blow. People would have started making phone calls and writing letters and saying, hey, let's, let's cut a deal with them. We don't need to fight them over this. This is, all, this is Asia's problem, not ours. America wanted to be mm -hmm. isolationist. America didn't want to get drawn into the war. Some people did, but lots of people didn't. There would have been a lot of politics going on around that. Yeah. You know, even today, some people think it's awful of us to drop the bombs. They don't understand. Yeah. This, this is a whole new element that you yeah. brought up today mm -hmm. about the capabilities to have done real serious damage to us. So I'm surprised no book has been written to explain that. You mean about the germ warfare? Or about well, warfare? not only the German. I think most people understand the ME-362 and the A-1 rocket and all of that. But I don't think most people understand what you talked about today and the ability to hit uh, New York City, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew about the West Coast. And in fact, didn't the Doolittle, the group that became the Doolittle Raiders, they, they took out a sub at one point um, before they, they, they came to Columbia and then volunteered for the mission. You, you're talking about the, the raid on the Panama Canal? Right. No, I'm talking about the, 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 the crew that became the Doolittle Raiders that had the most experience in the B-25. They were in Oregon, Pendleton, mm -hmm. and they were they were doing they were um, basically um, making sure that nobody attacked us from the West Coast. And they did shoot down a sub. I don't know if it was one of those subs. They, they no, shot I don't think no, it wasn't one of those. But it yeah. could have been one of the other Japanese. But it was, and I had just read about the Santa Barbara thing. Um, Yesterday, yeah. Well, a lot of people, I think, are not aware, even aware of that. The fact that the Japanese actually attacked uh, mainland United States uh, in 1942. 
That would make a good book today in, in light of We've got time for one more question. If, if we hadn't dropped those bombs, what would have happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough call. It, it would have, you know, it's just, basically they say, you know, we're talking about the um, perhaps a million casualties in order to, in order to take the Japanese home islands. And would we, you know, would we have wanted to do that uh, or not? Well, you know, President Truman decided, no, we're not going to do that. And chips fall where they may. And so that you know that gets debated for the next 65 years, but that was his decision. Okay, we have one more one question, more question. Dr. Costello, in the back. I'll give you the honor of the last question. Yep. It's not a question; it's a statement um, about isolation. You know, the draft only passed by one vote. Um, it was passed because of a one vote for it. But if that vote had gone the other way, there would have been no draft. The second thing is um, Nimitz. Um, um, after the after the attack, he said they, they really uh, what they goofed. They never got his dry docks. They never got his ammunition, and they never got his oil. They were buried under the pineapple field, and um, so he was able to recover. Yeah. Well, they missed a lot. They missed a lot. I mean, they, we focus a lot on the on the carriers that weren't there, but your your point is well taken. They also were supposed to hit the the fuel reserves, and and they didn't. And so that did give the, the, the fleet an opportunity to get some ships out there, have some presence, and at least get some semblance of what ended up being the force that, uh, that defended Midway six months later. That was a major, a major problem. Yeah, good question. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, uh, as, you're, as you're coming up, if you didn't get a chance to take a close look at the model of the I-400 before I Put it away, come up and take a look at it. Just please don't touch it though, it's very delicate. And one of those airplanes might take off.